Chapter 17 North and South This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Laura, Iowa, USA North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell Chapter 17 What is a Strike? There are briars besetting every path which call for patient care. There is a cross in every lot and an earnest need for prayer. Margaret went out heavily and unwillingly enough, but the length of a street, yes, the air of a Milton street, cheered her young blood before she reached her first turning. Her step grew lighter, her lip redder. She began to take notice, instead of having her thoughts turned so exclusively inward. She saw unusual loiters in the streets, men with their hands in their pockets sauntering along, Loud laughing and loud spoken girls clustered together, apparently excited to high spirits and a boisterous independence of temper and behavior. The more ill looking of the men, the discreditable minority, hung about on the steps of the beer houses and gin shops, smoking and commenting pretty freely on every passer by. Margaret disliked the prospect of the long walk through these streets before she came to the fields which she had planned to reach. Instead, she would go and see Bessie Higgins. It would not be so refreshing as a quiet country walk, but still it would perhaps be doing the kinder thing. Nicholas Higgins was sitting by the fire smoking as she went in. Bessie was rocking herself on the other side. Nicholas took the pipe out of his mouth and standing up, pushed his chair towards Margaret. He leant against the chimney-piece in a lounging attitude, while she asked Bessie how she was. Who's rather down in the mouth in regards to spirits, but who's better in health? Who doesn't like this strike? Who's a deal too much set on peace and quietness at any price? This is the third strike I've seen, said she, sighing as if that was answer and explanation enough. Well, third time pays for all. See if we don't dang the masters this time. See if they don't come and beg us to come back at our own price. That's all. We missed it afore time, my grantcha. But this time we laid our plans desperate deep. Why do you strike, asked Margaret? Striking is leaving off work to get your own rate of wages, is it not? You must not wonder at my ignorance. Where I come from, I never heard of a strike. I wish I were there, said Bessie wearily, but it's not for me to get sick and tired of strikes. This is the last I'll see. Before it's ended, I shall be in the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Who's so full of the life to come, who cannot think of the present? Now I, you see, am bound to do the best I can here. I think a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So them's the different views we take on the strike question. But, said Margaret, if the people struck as you call it, where I come from, as they are mostly all field laborers, the seed would not be sown, the hay got in, the corn reaped. Well, said he, he had resumed his pipe and put his well in the form of an interrogation. Why, she went on, what would become of the farmers? He puffed away. I reckon they'd have either to give up their farms or to give fair rate of wage. Suppose they could not or would not do the last. They could not give up their farms all in a minute, however much they might wish to do so. But they would have no hay, nor corn to sell that year. And where would the money come from to pay the laborers' wages the next? Still puffing away, at last he said, I know not of your ways down south. I have heard there a pack of spiritless, downtrodden men, welly clemmed to death, too much days with clemming to know when they're put upon. Now it's not so here. 
we known when we're put upon, and we too much blood in us to stand it. We just take our hands from our looms and say, You may clem us, but you'll not put upon us, my masters, and be dang to them. They shan't this time. I wish I lived down south, said Bessie. There's a deal to bear there, said Margaret. There are sorrows to bear everywhere. There's very hard bodily labor to be gone through, with very little food to give strength. But it's out of doors, said Bessie, and away from the endless, endless noise and sickening heat. It's sometimes in heavy rain, and sometimes in bitter cold. A young person can stand it, but an old man gets racked with rheumatism and bent and withered before his time. Yet he must just work on the same, or else go to the workhouse. I thought you was so taken with the ways of the South Country. So I am, said Margaret, smiling a little, as she found herself thus caught. I only mean, Bessie, there's good and bad in everything in this world. And as you felt the bad up here, I thought it but fair you should know the bad down there. "'And you say they never strike down there?' asked Nicholas abruptly. "'No,' said Margaret. "'I think they have too much sense.' "'And I think,' replied he, dashing the ashes out of his pipe with so much vehemence that it broke. "'It's not that they've too much sense, but they've too little spirit.' "'Oh, father,' said Bessie, "'what have you gained by striking? "'Think of that first strike, when mother died, how we all had to clem. "'You the worst of all.' and yet many a one went in every week at the same wage, till all were gone that there was work for, and some beggars went all their lives that after. Ay, said he, that their strike was badly managed. Folks got in the management of it, as were either fools or not true men. You'll see, it'll be different this time. But all this time you've not told me what you're striking for, said Margaret again. Why, you see, there's five or six masters who have set themselves again paying the wages they've been paying these two years past, and flourishing upon, and getting richer upon, and now they come to us and say we're to take less, and we won't. We'll just clem them to death first, and see who'll work for em then. They'll have killed the goose that laid em the golden eggs, I reckon. And so you plan dying in order to be revenged upon them? No, said he, I do not. I just look forward to the chance of dying at my post sooner than yield. That's what folk call fine and honorable in a soldier, and why not in a poor weaver chap? But, said Margaret, a soldier dies in the cause of the nation, in the cause of others. He laughed grimly. My lass, said he, you're but a young wench. But don't you think I can keep three people, that's Bessie and Mary and me, on sixteen shilling a week? Don't you think it's for myself I'm striking work at this time? Just as much in the cause of others as yon soldier. Only my happen the cause he dies for is just that of somebody he never clapped eyes on, nor heard on all his born days. While I take up John Boucher's cause, as lives next door but one, with the sickly wife and eight children, none of em factory age, and I don't take up his cause only, though he's a poor good for naught as can only manage two looms at a time. But I take up the cause of justice. Why are we to have less wage now, I ask, than two year ago? Don't ask me, said Margaret. I am very ignorant. Ask some of your masters. Surely they will give you a reason for it. It is not merely an arbitrary decision of theirs, come to without reason. You're just a foreigner and nothing more, said he contemptuously. Much you know about it. Ask the masters. They'd tell us to mind our own business, and they'd mind theirs. Our business being, you understand, to take the baited wage and be thankful, and their business to bait us down to Clemen Point, to swell their profits. That's what it is. But, said Margaret, determined not to give way, although she saw she was irritating him, the state of trade may be such as not to enable them to give you the same remuneration. State of trade? That's just a piece of master's humbug. It's rate of wages I was talking of. The masters keep the state of trade in their own hands. 
and just walketh forward like a black bugaboo to frighten naughty children within to being good. I'll tell you it's their part, their cue, as some folks call it, to beat us down, to swell their fortunes, and it's ours to stand up and fight hard, not for ourselves alone, but for them round about us, for justice and fair play. We help to make their profits, and we ought to help spend them. It's not that we want their brass so much this time, as we've done many a time afore. We ain't getting money laid by, and we're resolved to stand and fall together. Not a man on us will go in for less wage than the union says is our due. So I say hooray for the strike, and let Thornton and Slickson and Hamper and their set look to it. Thornton, said Margaret. Mr. Thornton of Marble Street? Aye, Thornton of Marble Mill, as we call him. He is one of the masters you are striving with, is he not? What sort of master is he? Did you ever see a bulldog? Set a bulldog on hind legs and dress him up in coat and breeches, and you just gettin' John Thornton. Nay, said Margaret, laughing, I deny that. Mr. Thornton is plain enough. But he's not like a bulldog, with its short broad nose and snarling upper lip. No, not in look, I grant ya. But let John Thornton get a hold on a notion, and he'll stick to it like a bulldog. You might pull him away with a pitchfork ere he'd leave go. He's worth fighting with, is John Thornton. As for Slickson, I take it, some of these days he'll wheedle his men back with bare promises that they'll just get cheated out of as soon as they're in his power again. He'll work his fines well out on him, I'll warrant. He's as slippery as an eel, he is. He's like a cat, as sleek and cunning and fierce. It'll never be an honest up-and-down fight with him as it will be with Thornton. Thornton's as dour as a door now, an obstinate chap, every inch on him, thou bulldog. Poor Bessie, said Margaret, turning round to her. You sigh over it all. You don't like struggling and fighting as your father does, do you? No, said she heavily. I'm sick on it. I could have wished to have had other talk about me in my latter days than just the clashing and clanging and clattering that has wearied all my life long about work and wages and masters and hands and knobsticks. Poor wench, latter days be fared. Thou art looking aside better already for a little stir and change. Beside, I shall be a deal here to make it more lively for thee. Tobacco smoke chokes me, said she querulously. Then I'll never smoke no more in the house, he replied tenderly. But why dost thou not tell me afore, thou foolish wench? She did not speak for a while, and then so low that only Margaret heard her. I reckon he'll want all the comfort he can get out of either pipe or drink afore he's done. Her father went out of doors, evidently to finish his pipe. Bessie said passionately, Now am not I a fool? Am I not, miss? There, I knew I ought for to keep father at home, and away from the folk that are always ready for to tempt a man, in time a strike, to go drink and there my tongue must needs quarrel with that pipe of his. And he'll go off, I know he will, as often as he wants to smoke, and nobody knows where it'll end. I wish I'd let myself be choked first. But does your father drink? asked Margaret. No, not to say drink, replied she, still in that same wild, excited tone. But what when ye have? There are days with you, as with other folk, I suppose, when you get up and go through the hours, just longing for a bit of change, a bit of Philip, as it were. I know I had gone and bought a four-pounder out of another baker's shop, too common on such days, just because I sickened at the thought of going on forever with the same sight in my eyes, the same sound in my ears, and the same taste in my mouth, and the same thought or no thought for that matter, in my head, day after day, forever. I've longed for to be a man to go spreeing, even if we're only a tramp to some new place in search of work, and father, all men, have it stronger in them than me, to get tired of sameness and work forever. 
and what is them to do? It's little blame to them if they do go in the gin shop, for to make their blood flow quicker and more lively, and see things they never see at no other time, pictures and looking glass and such like. But father never was a drunkard, though maybe he's got worse for drink now and then. Only you see. And now her voice took a mournful, pleading tone. At times the strike, there's much to knock a man down, for all they start so hopefully. And where's the comfort to come from? He'll get angry and mad. They all do. And then they get tired out with being angry and mad. And maybe had done things in their passion they'd be glad to forget. Bless your sweet, pitiful face, but you do not know what a strike is yet. Come, Bessie, said Margaret, I won't say you're exaggerating, because I don't know enough about it, but perhaps, as you're not well, you're only looking on one side, and there is another, and a brighter, to be looked to. It's all well enough for you to say so, who have lived in pleasant green places all your life long, and never known want, or care, or wickedness either, for that matter. Take care, said Margaret, her cheek flushing and her eye lightening. How you judge, Bessie. I shall go home to my mother, who is so ill, so ill, Bessie, that there's no outlet but death for her out of the prison of her great suffering, and yet I must speak cheerfully to my father, who has no notion of her real state, and to whom the knowledge must come gradually, the only person, the only one who could sympathize with me and help me, whose presence could comfort my mother more than any other earthly thing, is falsely accused, would run the risk of death if he came to see his dying mother. This I tell you, only you, Bessie. You must not mention it. No other person in Milton Hardly any other person in England knows. Have I not care? Do I not know anxiety, though I go about well-dressed and have food enough? Oh, Bessie, God is just, and our lots are well portioned out by him, although none but he knows the bitterness of our souls. I ask your pardon, replied Bessie humbly. Sometimes, when I thought of my life and the little pleasure I've had in it, I believe that maybe I was one of those doomed to die by the falling of a star from heaven, and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and men died of the waters because they were made bitter. One can bear pain and sorrow better if one thinks it has been prophesied long before for one. Somehow, then it seems as if my pain was needed for the fulfillment other ways it seems all sent for nothing nay bessie think said margaret god does not willingly afflict don't dwell so much on the prophecies but read the clearer parts of the bible i dare say it would be wiser but where would i hear such grand words of promise hear to owe anything so far different from this dreary world and this town above a as in revelations Many's the time I've repeated the verses in the seventh chapter to myself, just for the sound. It's as good as an organ, and is different from every day, too. No, I cannot give up revelations. It gives me more comfort than any other book in the Bible. Let me come and read you some of my favorite chapters. I said she greedily, come. Father will maybe hear ya. He's deaved with my talkin'. He says it's all not to do with the things of today, and that's his business. Where's your sister? Gone, fustian cutting. I were loth to let her go, but somehow we must live, and the union can't afford us much. Now I must go. You have done me good, Bessie. I done you good. Yes, I came here very sad, and rather to have to think my own cause for grief was the only one in the world, and now I hear how you have had to bear for years, and that makes me stronger. Bless ya, I thought all the good doing was on the side of the gentle folk. I shall get proud if I think I can do good to you. You won't do it if you think about it, but you'll only puzzle yourself if you do. 
that's one comfort. You're not like no one I ever seed. I don't know what to make of you. Nor I of myself. Goodbye. Bessie stilled her rocking to gaze after her. I wonder if there are many folk like her down south. She's like a breath of country air somehow. She freshens me up above a bit. Who'd have thought that face, as bright and as strong as the angel I dream of, could have known the sorrow she speaks on. I wonder how she'll sin. All on us must sin. I think a deal on her, for sure. But Father does the like I see, and Mary even. It's not often who stood up enough to notice much. End of chapter 17